So our next speaker is going to talk about federal and state FMLA and Connecticut paid leave. So many of you have probably attended one or more presentations given by Andrea Barton-Reeves. And she has had just about enough of you all. And so she <laughs> is not back. <laughs> OK, but we have Erin Choquette, who is general counsel at the Paid Leave Authority. Um, she's going to focus on some of the nuances between the three types of leave, federal FMLA, Connecticut FMLA and paid leave in Connecticut. Um, and she's also going to give you in some information about how the paid leave program is going. And if you have questions about that, please feel free to ask those questions. So join me in welcoming Erin Choquette. Thank you, Diane. It's so nice to actually be in person and um, do these presentations standing up? It's a little bit weird to stand up in your living room during the hundred and hundreds of Zoom webinars we've been doing for the past couple of years. But today we're going to talk about the Connecticut FMLA, the federal FMLA, and the Connecticut Paid Leave Act. I'm going to start by just making sure we get to the agenda. Oh, we don't need to see that. Okay. I'm going to start by just going through some of the definitions, things that are common amongst the three laws. And then we're going to talk about how to implement or how Connecticut paid leave is being implemented and the benefits process. And then we'll talk about how you as employers, and particularly with the HR responsibilities, of implementing the FMLA. There should be plenty of time for questions, so I'm going to try and zoom through the slides so that there's time for questions. But I do try to have this answer a lot of questions that we know we've received. So See if, my, if I answered you already, and then we'll go with plenty of time for questions at the end. Okay. It's so cool to have it up here instead of over there. I'm just thrilled. All right. So the Paid Leave Authority is a quasi-public agency that was created by statute in 2019 for the purpose of creating the Paid Leave Program. The reason I point out that we're a quasi-public agency is that one of the things that is different about a quasi is that we don't do regulations. We do policies that are publicly noticed and then adopted by our board. So our policies are on our website. We try to make them easily accessible, try to have some standard citation procedures, but they're not regulations. So don't look on the Secretary of State's website for us. Look to our website, ctpaidleave.org. So the purpose of the program is to make sure that employees who need to take time off from work for qualifying reasons have access to income so they can pay their bills while they're home taking care of themselves or a family member. But we think it's also important to make sure that employers, healthcare providers, everyone involved in the process has an understanding of their roles and responsibilities. And we're trying to be as helpful as we can. So a couple things that hopefully you already know. Contributions started a year ago. So as of January 1st of 2021, you should have already been deducting one half of 1% from your employees' wages and sending those contributions to us on a quarterly basis. The contributions are due every quarter, but we give you a one-month grace period so you don't have to get them out on March 31st. You can get them to us on April. Um, and then starting this past January, January 1st, 2022, benefits became available to employees for leaves that started on or after January 1st, 2022. So as I said, let's start with some definitions. FMLA is very familiar to all of you. It stands for the Family and Medical Leave Act. There are two that you need to be thinking about, the federal FMLA and the Connecticut FMLA. And you really need to be thinking about Connecticut FMLA because it changed significantly in January. FMLA provides eligible workers with job-protected time off from work. So when they take the time off, they get their same job back. They can't be penalized for taking that time off. Both laws say that the leave can be unpaid or paid with employer-provided uh, benefits, like a sick time accruals, vacation accruals, um, generous leave policies that say you'll just pay them while they're out. So the law says they're unpaid, or if the employer wants, they can provide pay. Most employers that I've been aware of in my experience will require employees to use some or part of their accruals. 
Connecticut paid leave is sort of a misnomer. We don't provide leave. We provide money. So focus on the paid part. We don't provide any job protected time off from work, but we do provide your employees with a source of income replacement so that they can, as I said, pay their bills when they're out. The employees apply to the paid leave authority for these paid leave benefits. Lots of times people refer to it as PFML or um, paid leave. We try to focus on CTPL simply to avoid confusion with FMLA. But if you hear about PFML, that's, that's also us. So FMLA, paid leave, you have to have a qualifying reason. The qualifying reasons are mostly the same amongst the three laws, but there are some distinctions. First, medical leave, your own serious health condition. Um, the definition of serious health condition includes being pregnant. It also includes being an organ or bone marrow donor, although the Connecticut laws specifically spike those out. Then there's bonding leave. That's the leave to, to take time off from work to create that emotional and physical attachment with that new member of your family, the newborn child, the newly adopted child, or the newly placed foster child. Both parents can take bonding leave, but only parents can take bonding leave. So, um, you know, your, the baby's grandparents might be hugely involved in the baby's life, maybe too much involved in the baby's life, but they're not taking the bonding leave unless they're planning to raise the child, right? So if you have someone who's not the traditional parent raising the child, that's bonding, but it has to be the parent. And again, it's any, any gender. Bonding leave may be taken any time within the 12 months from the date the child is born, placed, or adopted. Um, okay. And then there's caregiver leave. Caregiver leave is the leave you take to care for a family member who is sick. And we're going to talk a lot about that in a minute. Then there's the two ones that I think people forget about, which are the military caregiver leave and qualifying exigency leave. This is not leave for the person who's in the armed services. This is leave for the family member of the person in the armed services. For military caregiver leave, it's leave when your parent, spouse, child, next of kin, is injured in the armed services, and you need to take leave to care for that person. Qualifying exigency leave is leave for when your parent, spouse, or child is deployed, and there are eight specific qualifying exigencies. It's basically time that you need to deal with this disruption in your life. Um, maybe you need to take time off to, to get a will. Maybe you need to set up some financial arrangements. Maybe the person who's being deployed was the primary caretaker of their child, and now you need to set up alternative care. You can't just take qualifying exigency leave to be the primary caregiver of a child. Like, it's like, oh, they're deployed for six months, I'll be out, see you see in July. No, there's not a lot of employees who want that, but that's not what it is. It's to set up alternative child care. There are eight reasons, and then there's the ninth. Any other reason that the employee and employer mutually agree counts as a qualifying exigency leave. Um, to me, this is the honeymoon one, right? We had an employee who was supposed to get married, her fiance got notice of deployment, they decided to get married right away. You have to be married in Connecticut because it's a parent, spouse, or child. There's no affinity relationship for this one. And so we couldn't give her the leave to get married, but we said, hey, if you get married, we can give you leave to take your honeymoon. That was a mutually agreed upon qualifying exigency. Honestly, the only one I've heard of in the, since 2008, that, since this law has been around, but it's there. And then there's the Family Violence Leave Act. This is not FMLA. This is not part of either federal FMLA or state FMLA. It is a separate state law, 3151SS, for those of you keeping track at home. It's the law that says an employee who is a victim of family violence can t receive um, job protected time away from work to go to court, to receive counseling or medical treatment, to uh, relocate or um, obtain other services from a victim services organization. The statute says that an employee must be provided at least 12 unpaid days in a calendar year. And under the Connecticut Paid Leave Act, that employee could come to us for benefits for those 12 days. So those are the reasons. Let's talk about serious health condition for a second. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but I just want you to know that the definition of serious health condition is multifaceted. It could be incapacity plus treatment. So I'm out for more then three consecutive calendar days, I see a doctor within those first seven days, and the doctor for treatment. It's not just I saw the doctor. The doctor says, yes, you need treatment. 
So evaluation and treatment, and then the doctor says, you need follow-up care. So I'm gonna put you on some sort of regimen of prescription drugs, I'm gonna send you to physical therapy, I'm gonna have you come back in two weeks for more evaluation and treatment. Uh, I'm really focusing on this one because with the COVID spike, we had a lot of people apply to us for benefits saying, hey, I got a COVID test, I'm positive, give me the benefits, and we're like, sorry, we really apologize. But under the statute, that's not a serious health condition. You're not getting treatment. The um, federal FMLA regulations actually call out the flu as an example. Um, if you're just getting bed rest, if you're being told to stay at home, take over-the-counter medicine, have the chicken soup, drink a lot of tea, you feel horrible and we're sorry about that, but that's not treatment, that's not a serious health condition. Um, there's also chronic condition where you have to see a doctor for treatment for that condition at least twice a year. Um, there's sort of the permanent long-term situation where you know that you've got basically a hospice situation. Um, you've got multiple treatments, so dialysis, radiation, chemo, all of those things count. And then there's pregnancy. The pregnancy counts for both prenatal care as well as being unable to work because you've got complications. It also counts for sort of the childbirth and recovery. That all fits under the FMLA definition of pregnancy. Under Connecticut FMLA and under the Paid Leave Act, an employee who has an incapacitation during her pregnancy can access an extra two weeks of leave and an extra two weeks of benefits. Because the FMLA defines incapacitation to include treatment for a condition, we and the Department of Labor have determined that going to prenatal visits could you could access those two extra weeks for those prenatal visits, or if you have complications to your pregnancy, or say you just have the bad luck to get otherwise sick, say you break your leg, when you're pregnant, you could access those extra two weeks, okay? Um, COVID, just a quick reminder, diagnosis is not the same as a serious health condition. We got, um, I was saying to a couple of folks, we were ready, we thought, for the onslaught of claims. We knew there was a pent up demand. We'd seen what happened in other states. We were like, it's gonna be a lot more than the standard. Well, it's gonna ebb and out. So we were geared up. And then we got over 20% higher claim volume than we expected because we went live in January and that's been Omicron hit. And so like that extra 25% of Omicron cases set us back a little bit. So instead of being able to um, reach a decision within five business days of a completed file, we're actually trending about 10 to 15 days of a completed file. We're working through the backlog, kind of swallowing that elephant and digesting it. We should be back in a few weeks to sort of the faster decision. But a lot of those people, as I said, applied for benefits saying, here, I've got a test. And we're, like, we're so sorry, but that's not enough. So we're working through all of those. And I say that to you too for FMLA purposes, because it's not FMLA either, just so you know. Okay, I told you I wanted to spend a little time on caregiver leave. You can take caregiver leave for federal FMLA, state FMLA, and CP paid leave benefits, but the definition depends on the law. Under federal FMLA and the old Connecticut FMLA, it had to be your parent or your spouse, or your child who is under 18 or 18 and over who had a disability as defined by the ADA, which prevented you from engaging in three or more activities of daily living. It was a high definition, right? And relatively small group of people. Now, and that's still the case for federal. But with now, with Connecticut FMLA and with the paid leave program, you can take caregiver leave and receive benefits to care for your parent or your spouse, your child of any age, your sibling, um, grandparent, or grandchild. So a whole new population of people that you can take leave to care for. And then there's the affinity relationship. Now you can take leave to care for someone who is related to you by blood or affinity, whose relationship the employee demonstrates is the equivalent of parent, spouse, child, grandparent, grandchild, or sibling. What does this mean in practice? Well, it means that the Connecticut is finally recognizing that families come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I used to say when I started doing these things, like we're not Ozzie and Harriet, but even I'm not that old, like I didn't watch Ozzie and Harriet. So then I started saying um, family ties. And then everyone's like, okay, you are old, because that's a really old show. <laughs> but then when Bob Saget died, I was like, okay, you know what? Even the shows I used to watch showed non-traditional families. So if you think about Uncle Jesse and Joey, they're not related, but they lived together for several years and raised a family together. I would say that they were the equivalent of a sibling, right? Like if so, if Jesse got sick, Joey could take leave to care for him and receive benefits. 
getting out of the TV world, what we're seeing most often is this is being used by people who are in a long-term significant relationship. Um, think Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell. They're not married, they don't plan on getting married, they have no marriage license, but they're, they're together, right? Before, Goldie couldn't take care of Kurt and Kurt couldn't take care of Goldie and get it as FMLA. But now, under Connecticut law, they can call this FMLA, or Connecticut FMLA at least, and receive benefits for it. So Aaron, can you switch a little closer to the microphone? Sure, Thanks. I thought I was, ooh, I, th I thought I was um, echoing, so I'll try just to do better. Okay, so those are the definitions. What do you need to know about paid leave? The first thing you need to know is, are you a covered employer? Most likely the answer is yes. The statute is really broad and says basically almost every employer with one or more employees working in Connecticut is covered. We really mean it, one or more. So um, if you have a nanny, a gardener, and you're paying you know, them wages, giving them a W-2, you're an employer. So that's sort of shocking for some folks. Um, the state of Connecticut is a covered employer as to our non-unionized employees. The unionized employees are not part of the program unless they collectively bargain in. And that's in the statute. The statute also excludes the federal government, um, municipalities, and boards of education unless their unionized employees bargain in for coverage. And then if they do, then the non-union folks come into the coverage as well. Private, elementary, and secondary schools are excluded, and there's no opt-in for them. And then railroads are excluded because there's a federal law which covers them. And the governments of other states are excluded and the sovereign nations are excluded. So the Mashantuckets and the Mohegans are not covered by our program, so the employees who work at their casinos are not covered either. Second question, okay, I work for a covered employer, but am I personally eligible? For, for paid leave, we look at how much money have they made in the base period, which is the first four of the five most recently completed quarters. If they have earned at least $2,325 from one or more covered employers in that base period, they're eligible for benefits. They also have to be, well, I shouldn't say they're eligible for benefits, they're eligible for benefits if they also meet the next thing, which is they are either currently employed by a covered employer, or they had been employed by a covered employer at some point in the 12 weeks before they apply to us, or they're a sole proprietor or self-employed individual who's registered with us. So sole props and self-employeds are not required to participate for themselves, but they have an opportunity to opt in, kind of like workers' comp. If they opt in, they pay a half a percent contribution on their self-employment taxes, and then they can apply for benefits. The paid leave authority, not the employer, makes the determination about eligibility for purposes of paid leave benefits. Quite frankly, you don't know what your employees earned at their old job, but we do because we have access to cool data from DOL and DRS. So that's how we make that determination. The next big question is, okay, what are the benefits? Um, again, we look at the first four of the five most recently completed quarters. We look to see how much the person earned in their two highest earning quarters, divide that by 26, and that becomes their um, base weekly wages. If their base weekly wages is 40, less than or equal to 40 times the Connecticut minimum wage, their benefit will be 95% of those base weekly wages. I keep saying the base weekly wages because it's different than what they're earning right now. We don't really look at what I earned in my paycheck last week. We look at what I earned last October, right? So it's just important to know that that number is different than what you're paying. If you earn more than 40 times the Connecticut minimum wage, um, the benefit calculation is sort of a sliding scale. It's hard to say, it's even harder to follow, but we have a benefits estimator on our website, so you can sort of type in the number and get an estimate about whether you fit into the 95%, whether you fit into the sliding scale, or whether you're capped, because our statute says that benefits are capped at 60 times Connecticut minimum wage. Now our entitlement is 12 weeks in a 12-month period, and we use a rolling look back for the 12-month period. And for CT paid leave, it's 12 weeks for all of the relieve reasons, including military caregiver, except for two. As I mentioned, for family violence, the entitlement is 12 days, so our benefit is 12 days. And then also the two extra weeks for incapacity during pregnancy. Those are the two exceptions. We get tons of questions about how employers' paid leave policies interact with Connecticut paid leave program. Uh, 
and there are basically four scenarios. But before I tell you the four scenarios, I'll tell you the two statutes that govern these four scenarios. First, our statute says an employee may receive benefits from the authority and their employer concurrently as long as the total amount does not exceed 100% of their regular wages. And then the other statutes in Connecticut FMLA, which says the employer may permit or require an employee to use paid time off while they're receiving pay Connecticut FMLA. However, they must be allowed to hold on to two weeks of their paid time off for other purposes. Like, this is sort of like the Disneyland trip, right? When they were legislating or negotiating this at the legislature, people came and said, my employer makes me use all my PTO. And so I had this trip of a lifetime planned we were going to go to Disney, and then I got sick earlier in the year, and my employer made me use all my time so that by the time I got well, it was time for my trip, I had no time off. And so they were like, okay, everyone gets two weeks. You get to keep two weeks. So just keep those two statutes in mind. One option, the employee has no accruals, or the employer doesn't, let them, doesn't require them to use the accruals they have. So as far as we're concerned, there's zero employer paid time off, the employee who's eligible applies to us, the benefits will start as of the first day of leave. Scenario two, the employee has tons of paid time off and the employer wants them to use it, bearing in mind the two extra weeks, and they say, hey look, you're out for your own serious health condition, you've got six months of sick leave, we want you to use that sick leave because we don't want you to stack these leave entitlements, which is perfectly legal and quite honestly, perfectly rational from the employer's perspective. Um, we're gonna make you use your sick leave. The employer's gonna tell us they're fully covered. In which case, we'll say, okay, you already are at over 100% or at 100%. We're gonna deny benefits, but your leave entitlement, or sorry, your benefit entitlement remains untouched. So if you have some other leave down the road, come back to us, you'll still have your full 12 week allotment. Third scenario is what we see mostly which is employee has some PTO. Maybe they have enough to cover them for two weeks, but they're gonna be out for eight. So the employer tells us, employee's got two weeks of PTO, not touching the extra stuff we're holding in reserve, and so paid leave is gonna start on the week three. The fourth scenario is the most complicated, which is the employer says, we'll provide a percentage. Maybe we have a short-term disability policy that says we provide 60% or we just have sick leave bank and we give 50%. Okay, um, you tell us that, but you tell us, are you primary or secondary? If you're primary, that means you're gonna pay and you're gonna tell us what percentage you pay and then we'll adjust the benefit calculation accordingly. So if you pay 60%, we'll pay 40% of what we would otherwise have paid. Doesn't mean that the person gets 100% of their regular wages, because our benefit is not based on regular wages, our benefit is based on last year's wages, but it's the closest we can do. Or you're secondary, meaning you want us to pay first, and you guys are gonna top off. So we'll pay whatever we're gonna pay, and um, you'll just pay something additional to the employee. Now I keep saying you'll tell us, and we'll tell you. You tell us because we have an employment verification form, and on the form, basically have four boxes that mimic these four charts. You just check the, all the boxes that apply. And if you are secondary, you tell us you're secondary, great. If you tell us you're you know, box four primary, you tell us what your percentage is and we'll adjust. So that's how you tell us. We tell you because when we approve a claim, we send an email to whoever you've identified on that employment verification form as your contact and we say, okay, Erin was approved and she's gonna get $500 in benefits per week estimated so that you can adjust, okay? All right, how is this working? Well, quickly on the paid leave side, there's two parts to it. There's the contributions, which we've mentioned already. It's an employee funded program. Employees pay a half a percent and they um, up to their social security contribution limit. The employer's responsibility on the contribution side is to deduct that half a percent from the FICA wages and remit them to us. They give us, you have to give us a little bit of background information, but it's not a whole lot. We don't ask for like page, page, pages and pages of payroll data. We've received those contributions and processed them. The Connecticut Department of Labor's involvement in this part is limited to authorization of extra deductions. 
So because this program was new, we worked with the Department of Labor to create a catch-up period. So for employers that didn't um, get the deductions kind of up and up rolling in January of last year, we said, OK, you've got this catch-up period. You can take an extra 1% and sort of try and get caught up on those deductions. That catch-up period ends on March 31st. And we've talked to DOL. They're not interested in extending it. We're, frankly, not interested in having them extend it. So um, if you still haven't gotten caught up, you, your employees didn't make their contributions for the full now year and a quarter, and you want to take extra deductions, you're going to have to go and get a per specific permission from Connecticut DOL directly. And then there's the claim side of it. The relationship is really between the employee and the paid leave authority. The employee applies to us, either on our website, ctpaidleave.org, or by calling our third-party administrator, APLAC, and processing their claim online. They are required to provide us with supporting documentation, med cert, bonding papers, whatever it is, the, the um, identification verification and the employment verification. They do have to provide us with information if their situation changes at all, and they're required by statute to notify their employer that they have applied to us. In practice, they do that by giving you, the employer, the employment verification form that I mentioned. So that comes from the employee, not from us. Your role in, in implementing CTPL is really to fill out that form and get it to us. Um, we ask you to get it back within 10 days. There's a fax number and an email address. That's the fastest and easiest way to get it to us. Just give it to us. You don't even need to give it back to the employee. That's fine. Just give it to us. That's a really big source of delay is, is the employment verification forms. If you haven't told your employees who should be filling out those employment verification forms, please do. It would be a great addition to your employment handbook to say, hey, supervisors should not be filling out this form. HR should, or payroll should, or your, you know, the person who handles your leaves should. Somebody who knows what the employee's schedule is, if they're going to be required to use paid time off, um, if they've got workers' comp. Those are the questions we ask. So, Please identify who in your employment shop should be filling out those forms and let your employees know, and then send them to us. Um, you should, of course, be notifying your employees what your paid time off policies are because they're going to be asking, so just figure it out ahead of time and then let them know and be consistent. And of course, always refrain from discriminating or retaliating against your employees. Our responsibility is to process the claims, administer the benefits, and um, follow up and make sure that no one's committing fraud or doing anything wrong. And then if we deny a claim, the claimant can file an appeal with the Connecticut Department of Labor, and they will review that, that appeal and make a decision as to whether the decision was correct or not. We do have authority, if we find fraud, to impose penalties on the participants of the fraud, whether that's the employee um, and any sort of aiding and abetting employers or doctors. So anyone who is imposed a penalty for fraud could also appeal that to DOL. Okay, that's Connecticut FMLA. I'm sorry, that's Connecticut pay leave. Let me just talk quickly about Connecticut FMLA and then we'll get to questions. Remember, FMLA is Family and Medical Leave Act. This is the job protected side. This is what you guys do. This is the employee and employer relationship to make sure the employee gets the job protected leave they're entitled to. Are you covered? Well, federal FMLA says that you're covered if you have 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius and public sector entities are covered by FMLA, regardless of the size. Connecticut FMLA says you're covered if you have one or more employee. This is different than it used to be. It used to be 75, now it's one. You're most likely covered, unless you are a municipality, a board of education, a private elementary or secondary school, or a railroad, or if you're here from government of another state or from the uh, sovereign nations. Don't think you are, so I think you're covered. <laughs> Is your employee covered? Well, if you're subject to FMLA on the federal side, you have to look at both federal and state eligibility because you could have someone who's eligible for one but not the other. Federal FMLA unchanged. You have to work for the employer for 12 months and 1,250 hours in the 12 months immediately preceding leave. Connecticut FMLA changed. You have to work for the employee. The employee has to work for you for the three months immediately preceding leave. That's it. I see some unhappy faces. I'm sorry. <laughs> just the way it is. If they have worked for you for the three months immediately preceding leave, they're covered regardless of how many hours they worked. Connecticut DOL is in the process of finalizing their regulations, and one of the things they're talking about is how, you, how do you um, 
relate that to part-timers or per diems. So I, I have a, a link for you where you can check out what their regulations will look like. That's still up in the air, so I don't want to say it in a public format. How long is a job protected leave? Mostly the answer is 12, right? 12 weeks in a 12-month period under federal FMLA with 26 weeks for military caregiver. Connecticut FMLA changed. It is now 12 weeks in a 12-month period, so don't worry about that 16 and 24 anymore. But you've got 26 weeks for military caregiver and the 12, um, the two extra weeks for pregnancy incapacitation. And then remember, family violence leave, 12 unpaid calendar days. The family violence leave cannot be counted against FMLA. Just so you know, you have to keep it track. I'm not going to go through this slide because I've mentioned it already. I just have it there as a handy reference guide for you if you're like, okay, everything I used to know seems different. Why? Oh, it's because the law changed. <laughs> Implementing FMLA is the responsibility of the employer to work with the employee. The employee has to tell you or make you aware that they need time off from work for a job protected reason. If they tell you they've applied to us for CT paid leave benefits, they have now told you that they might need FMLA. So that receipt of that employment verification form starts your five business days to acknowledge that, oh, shoot, I have to do the eligibility determination and send them that notice of rights and responsibilities. So the employee has to let you know. They have to give you the documentation you require, and they have to um, comply with your policies. So you should have policies on this because you really want to make sure that they give you the documentation you require. You want to make sure they comply with your call and policies and they just don't abandon you. The employer has to determine eligibility, notify the employee if they're eligible, review the documentation the employee gives you, make a determination about whether the leave is approved or not, and then monitor the leave. Because you're dealing with different laws, you need to track all of them. Paid leave authority actually has no responsibility here. But when we do these trainings, it's really hard to talk about paid leave without talking about FMLA, so we talk about FMLA a whole lot. DOL has the responsibility, and as I mentioned, Connecticut DOL is promulgating regulations on this, um, and you can go to their website and see what those draft regulations look like. The federal DOL has responsibility over federal FMLA, and both agencies will hear complaints about denials of FMLA leave, interference, and retaliation claims. Okay, what does this look like? Employee lets you know that they need job, they need time off from work for a potentially qualifying reason. Most of your employees will not use the phrase FMLA. Some will. Mostly they're gonna be like, hey, guess what, I'm pregnant. Or, oh, I'm gonna need some time off next month because my mom needs hip surgery. You need to know and you need to train your supervisors and managers to know that, oh, this sounds like it might be FMLA. You want your managers and supervisors to immediately say, oh, hey, great, or oh, hey, that's too bad. You should go talk to HR. Don't talk to me, talk to HR. They should tell you 30 days in advance if the need for leave is foreseeable or as soon as practicable if the need is not foreseeable. But you have to have a policy that tells them to tell you, so you want that. Once they tell you that, you have five business days to determine if they're eligible and to provide them with that decision and give them a notice of rights and responsibilities. Both the Connecticut DOL and the federal DOL have a sample notice of rights and responsibilities forms on their websites that I encourage you to check out. With that notice, you're going to tell them what documentation they need to provide to you to substantiate the leave. Um, you have to give them 15 calendar days to respond. And if they tell you they're having trouble getting the documentation, you have to give them at least seven more days. So you have to communicate with them. If they fail to provide you with a complete and sufficient documentation, you can deny the leave. But again, you have to be communicating to say this is the consequence. Let's say they give you the documentation. You look at it, and you're like, half of it's blank, you have to give it back to them, tell them what's wrong, and give them at least seven days to cure. Once you've got a good med cert or good documentation, you have five business days to review it and either approve or deny the leave and let them know in writing if it's approved. And when you do that, you have to say, okay, well, you've got FMLA from the federal, FMLA under Connecticut, yes to one, no to the other, yes to both, this is when it starts, this is when it ends. And this is what we're going to do about your accruals. We're making you use your sick time, but we're not making you use your vacation or whatever your policy is. And then the employee has to tell you when they actually go out. If they've told you in advance or if they're out for an intermittent leave or a chronic condition where it could just have flare-ups, they need to specifically say, hey, this is it. This is my FMLA. They can't just call out and say that they're sick. 
you need to tell them that they can't just call it and tell them they're sick. You need to tell them it's FMLA. And then you have to track it. And you want to track each entitlement on its own line so you can make sure you know that they're not using too much and you can let them know when they're running out. So whole point of FMLA is job protection. So the employee gets the job back when they come back from leave. Same job. If that job is not available, and this is under Connecticut FMLA, federal says same or equivalent, Connecticut says same. And only if that job is not available for some reason other than you found a better worker, um, you have to give them that same job back. If the job is gone, you, know, you reorganize the department, you can give them an equivalent job. And when we say same, we mean same. Same salary, same benefits, same terms and conditions. You can't be like, oh, now you're working third shift in Stanford. <laughs> you used to work in Hartford first shift. It's the same. That's not OK. That's a violation. You're going to get yourself in front of the DOL. Um, remember, this is, FMLA is not the only law. There are other laws out there. The ADA, the Pregnancy Non-Discrimination Act, the Connecticut Fair Employment Practices Act, so particularly when you're talking about an employee who's out for their own serious health condition, they may have medical restrictions, but they can work. You have to think about your ADA stuff. Are there reasonable accommodations we can put in place to help this person come back sooner? Kevin and I were talking at the break. It's up to the employee to say, hey, I can't work. You can't say, oh, I could give you a reasonable accommodation, but it's easier for me to stick you out on leave. Like, if they can work and you can give them a reasonable accommodation that enables them to work, you got to work through that process. You can't just be like, oh, it's easier. You all found this out and went to the Supreme Court and got really nailed because they just sent everybody out who were pregnant on leave as soon as, I think they hit six months. That was bad. Um, remember workers' comp. Remember uh, pregnancy disability. One thing about workers' comp that I didn't say before, if an employee is receiving workers' comp benefits, they can't get benefits from CT paid leave. So we ask you about that because it's a statutory bar. You can't get one. There's no, like, topping off. You can't get one and both the other. Same thing for unemployment insurance. If you're getting unemployment, you can't get ours. Okay. Additional resources. We have lots of stuff on our website. We're changing it all the time, adding new stuff. We actually have another release tonight. But we have... Um, toolkits, we have posters, we have letters, we have handouts for you to give to your employees. Um, they're in English and Spanish right now. We're working to get other languages. They're in color and in black and white. If you want to print them out, if you want to email them, there's tons of stuff. So check it out. There's also lots of FAQs and videos. There's a whole step-by-step -step process for how to apply. Um, there's a quiz for like, do you think you're eligible? Let's see. Um, all of our forms are on the website as well. Just to note, we have a med cert that we created based on our kind of collective experience of what we would like a med cert to look like. Feel free to use it. DOL has a med cert for sample. Feel free to use theirs. We'll accept theirs. They'll accept ours. Uh, you don't want to make your employee do too much, sort of multiple work, but um, I like ours. I think ours is good. Um, we have FAQs. We have that benefits estimator. We have a contribution estimator. If you can't find the answers to your questions and you still have questions, contact us. We have a contact us button. Submit your question. Tell us if you want an email back or a phone call back, and we'll get back to you with answers to your questions. If your employees have filed a claim with us already and they have questions, they can go to the portal and go to the claim, the account that they created, and check on their case directly through our portal or by calling. Employers, you shouldn't be calling our third-party administrator. They're not supposed to talk to you. <laughs> this is employee money, employee medical information. As I said, we will let you know if they're approved or denied, um, and we will let you know how much. But if you have general questions about the program, you feel free to contact us. That's, that's perfectly acceptable. And then again, if you have questions about Connecticut FMLA, if you want to check out the forms, if you want to check out the regulations, you can go to the page on the Connecticut DOL website that's specifically created um, last a couple months ago, it's new FMLA guidance. Bookmark it, it's really handy. Um, if you ever do get a complaint against you or for your FMLA, um, that's where you go to respond to the complaint. So it's all kind of a one-stop shop. All right, now it's time for questions. <laughs> I have one over here. <laughs> I can't see with the lighting, so I'm just gonna let everyone tell me what they're, who's going up first. 
Hi, Erin. Um, I know you have a poster for the Connecticut um, paid leave, but it doesn't cover the FMLA information that people are supposed to post in July. Are you yes. guys gonna coordinate with the Department of Labor so there's one poster? Yes, so we are already coordinating with DOL on what that new poster says. So if you weren't aware of the situation that Jean is talking about, the statute says that as of July 1st, 2022, employers shall have a poster that indicates um, it's funny, it's in our section of the statute, but most of it relates to FMLA. So it's like the rules about FMLA and how to apply and all that stuff. So we're working with DOL to have one consolidated poster. One thing I didn't mention is there's a whole alternate compliance mechanism where employers who think they can or want to do um, their own CTP leave benefit can apply to us to have a private plan. If we approve you to have a private plan, you're gonna be administering the CTPL benefits. You can't just do it on your own, you have to come to us first. But if you are an approved private plan, you would put that on your poster so that people don't apply to us when they should be applying to your private plan. So those are the kinds of things we're working on with DOL. Hi, Erin. I've got a question from someone online. Okay. And the question is about the AFLAC forms. Um, so they're saying that it's confusing that the employer is supposed to send the medical forms, I mm -hmm. guess, first, but then they seem to get duplicative AFLAC forms. What are okay. you really supposed to do? Like, who gives the medical yep. cert? Okay, so the way it works is the employee applies to, uh, to us through AFLAC, and they'll get, I can't remember if we're calling it the welcome package or the claim package, but they get a, a document. And in that document, we say, okay, based on the leave reason you told us about, we're gonna need these documents to substantiate your leave reason. We also need you to um, give this employment verification form to your employer to have your employer fill out and complete. And then we need identity verification because we don't wanna just give money to the great unknown. Um, if the person's out for their own serious health condition or a caregiver, one of the documents is a medical certification. The employee is supposed to give that to their own doctor or the family member's doctor, and then that doctor sends it to us. The employer should not see the med cert. One thing that we do see is that employees might have already have given a med cert to their employer for their FMLA, and if they didn't make a copy of that, they might come to the employer and say, hey, can I get a copy of that med cert because I need to send it over to AFLAC. You know, sure, whatever. But the d employer should never be sending med certs to us. We don't want the employer involved in the med certs. But doesn't the, on the, so let's say the employer is concerned about the job protected leave, right? And on the DOL website, aren't there forms that, so when the employer first gives the notice of eligibility to the employee, don't they attach a medical cert for the employee to have their doctor fill out? And so, yes, that but that's the FMLA side. All right, so you might be doing it twice in a way because you'll, you're doing it for Connecticut, Connecticut, Connecticut FMLA. You're doing the notice of eligibility, and that will have a med cert. And then also, there's going to be an AFLAC med cert, maybe. So, okay. So there's. Let's just think about who's doing what. So the employee notifies the employer they need job protected leave. The employer says, okay, I'm gonna send you the notice of eligibility and the list of documents. You, employee, need to provide me, the employer. And that's their relationship. And that may include a med cert. The employee applies to us for income replacement. And we say, here's a list of documents you need to provide us. That may include a med cert. We'll accept a copy of the med cert the employee gave to the employer but we don't expect the employer to give it to us. We expect the employee to give it to us or the employee's doctor. So the employee is the one who's gonna to have to manage these documents. The most important thing for HR to know is that the employee is gonna give you that employment verification form and you need to send that to us. Okay, I've just It's got not as complicated as I'm making it sound. <laughs> like it really is. <laughs> I've got one other uh, online question and then Tony, I'll go to you. Um, so I've got a, an, a question from an employer who's, who says, um, what do we do? We're not covered by Connecticut paid FMLA, but we just got an AFLAC form. How do we tell our employee that we're not covered? 
So my question to you is, if you get an AFLAC form, has somebody determined that you are actually covered no. by, okay. So that form goes out immediately, like upon receipt. We haven't done the eligibility check yet. We changed the employment verification form just last week to now it has a question where it says, if you are the federal government, municipality, board of education, one of the non-covered employers, check this box and send it back. Don't fill out the rest of the form. Um, so, but if the, but that just went live last, on the 11th. Um, if the employee got the employment verification form before we changed it and the employer's like, I'm a private school, they can just write that in and send it back. Um, we do have other processes that are happening when we communicate with the employee to get that information, but we wanted to have belt and suspenders approach, so that's why we changed it. So if you know you're not covered, you can write that in and just send that back to us. Erin, okay. I have a question over yes. here. Good morning. Um, so I had an employee come to me this week. She said I might need to take some time off. She's only been with us a month. She said her daughter, is, Crohn's medicine isn't working. She might need surgery. We don't give PTO until after, they accrue it, just can't use it until 90 days. Mm -hmm. I sent them to your website. Yes. Was there anything else I should be doing? No. So the person doesn't have Connecticut FMLA. Um, because it's a caregiver situation, it's not even an ADA situation, so I wouldn't even send you down that road. So you did exactly the right thing. You will have to decide for yourselves if you are going to hold her job for her or give her preferred treatment if she, you know, yes. when she comes back. And you'll it, have to let her know that you're not holding the job or that you are. That's, that's not statutory, that's policy. Right, but um, but she also mentioned, well, it's probably going to be in, you know, like a few days here or a day here, and I'm like, I don't even think that's how you guys work. So we do, we do, we okay. do. We will pay benefits on an inter if someone's out on intermittent leave, they have to report into us. They they make a claim to us just like they make a claim to you, telling us frequency and duration, and all that, and then they have to tell us within two calendar days of each absence, and okay. we'll pay. So if they're out for half an hour, we'll give them. Um, a benefit payment for that half hour. Okay, thank you so much. I got one right. I have one right here. Okay, I can't see. On, on the verification form, you ask for hours worked, and we don't have a standard 40 hour work week. We have a 36 and a quarter hour work week. Do you modify your benefit based on our standard work week? Yes, so that's why we ask. We ask, and we, this isn't one of the things we changed. If you have a standard work week, you can just tell us your standard work week. If, you have, if the employee has a non-standard work week, basically because they work overtime is really what we're talking about there, but, or they're sort of shift workers, you give us the last 12 weeks that they worked, and be, that becomes their average work week. And so if they're out on block, a week is a week, their benefit is their benefit. But if they're out on intermittent leave or reduced schedule leave, we need to use that average work week to figure out the um, proportion of time that they're working versus not working, and then the benefit will be adjusted accordingly. So that's why we ask it. We don't just ask it to, to make more work. We actually need it to calculate the benefits. You gotta be on mic, I'm sorry. So we have someone who's going out on an intermittent leave, so she may have an hour. So are you calculating what she gets paid in an hour based on your maximum divided by our number of hours that she's working, or are you reducing her benefit from your your maximum, because she's qualified for the maximum. Right, so, like I'm not the math person. We, <laughs> we have, we call our magic spreadsheet, because um, one of our really good math people like created all these different scenarios. We were up to like 65 different scenarios. Um, I get that, I've been doing those worksheets too. <laughs> yeah, and this is like, you know, one employer, two employers, three employers, you know. They work one job during the week and another job on the weekends, but they're not taking leave from that job. So we have all the different scenarios. We will we use that and calculate it, and basically it's a proportional reduction. But when someone's out on intermittent, we, we figure out their hourly benefit and then figure out, okay, they're, um, if they're out one hour out of 36, then we're gonna pay them 136 of that benefit. Basically, don't hold me to the math. <laughs> 
but that's essentially what happens. And that's getting reported back to us through that yep. email address that's on the form. Yeah, so when we say that, we're going to say the weekly benefit is X, but she's approved for intermittent leave. And so... Um, You'll provide like an hourly... We don't provide the hourly because... Um, but we will provide the weekly benefit. And then we're, it's a... We're, we're called it a day two solution to try and provide more information on intermittents. We're just not there yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, I got a question over here. Okay. Aaron? If an employee is covered by short-term disability and long-term disability, what goes first? <laughs> <laughs> I love those insurance questions. So, well, the easy part is short-term always goes before long-term. Uh, long-term usually has a, a elimination period. The more difficult part is whether short-term is primary or secondary. And you'll have to look at your policy to see what it says. Most fully insured products specify that they're secondary. Um, they, they, they were very clear to us that that's what they do. But not all of them. Um, so you would look and say, oh, okay, they're saying secondary or they're saying that the employee must exhaust all other entitlements before utilizing this benefit. It's usually the language you would see. And so in that situation, you would notify us that the employee has short-term disability coverage through the employer and that's secondary. If, if you're one of the sort of few insurance products that says they're primary and they haven't changed yet because they're all changing, they say they're primary, you would tell us, okay, it's primary and the benefit is 60% of the wages. And then we would, as I said, adjust our benefit. Okay, I've got a question here. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. I have a scenario where since the state is behind on paying the claims, we have a lot of employees um, submitting their paperwork very early in advance. A majority of our employees have significant PTO accruals. I'm having a hard time figuring out, based off the capture of time filling out the form, how many days of PTO we're actually going to be paying them versus what's going to happen three months from now. So if someone has 60 days as of today, but they're not going out on leave for another two months, they may not have 60 days. And I just am having a hard time figuring what to report back to the state. Um, that's a great question. We were also having difficulty with those super early people, so we stopped accepting them. Um, so we now say on our website, well, because it's, it's just, there's so many variables. If you're applying to us six months in advance, the employer can't fill out the form, and the wages, like you're talking about different quarters, so like the whole determination of eligibility is all, like it, it's just, there's too many variables. So our website now says, um, don't apply more than 30 days in advance. Um, so, and, and the folks who kind of applied really early, we've reached out and said, we, we can't, we don't have the information. Um, so now it's 30 days in advance, so that should help with that. Yes. Thank you. Um, you talked about related by affinity. How are you guys certifying that to make sure it's not someone's neighbor down the street? Right. So we have a form that we, if they notify us that it's a caregiver situation, they have to complete a statement of family relationship. And on the statement of family relationship, if they indicate that it's a relationship by affinity, they have to give us an explanation of the relationship. By the statute, we're not allowed to ask for it to be certified. We're not allowed to ask for it to be like notarized. Um, and, and, the, um, and this is true for FMLA, too, so you should know this. Like, you can ask for a writing. DOL has a similar form as we do. So you can ask for a writing to make them explain the nature of the relationship, but you can't ask for it to be notarized. You can't ask for it to be an affidavit. You can't ask for, like, wedding pictures or, like, videos, you know, it's not like the, remember that movie Green Card? Like, we can't do that. The statute doesn't let us. Um, and then we do, we do make people aware that the consequences of fraud are, are significant, and as employers, you can make people aware that the consequences of fraud are significant. We know that it's an area of concern for a lot of employers, but other states have used this affinity relationship, and the federal government has used it for a few of their different leave programs. And what we're hearing from the other states, and the, like Chicago and stuff, some of the large municipalities, is employees tend not to want to commit fraud with this because it's, 
they might need that time for themselves or for their real family member. So it's like, how, you know, like, do I really want to give up this time now? But I, I've been in HR, I've been doing employment law for over 20 years. I get it. Like, there are issues. Um, and so you can follow up and, and if you have a reason to believe that there's fraud, like any other fraud, you can assess that. But you can't ask for anything more than a simple writing. I've got a question here. Okay. Uh, now, with the intermittent, uh, actually not intermittent, you said that they have to report that. My question is with intermittent taking time off. So they're taking, or paid time off. So if they're out, whether it's for consecutive days or intermittent, how do we report that on the form? To s we don't know what days they might want to take use a vacation day to get some money coming in or extra money coming in. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand your question. So you're talking about the employment verification form, and so you're like, hey, CT paid leave, you want us, the employer, to tell you how much accruals my employee is going to use. How do I know? Um, a good practice is to make your employees tell you when they apply for leave. So this, the state of Connecticut, as an employer, has a lot of employees who go out on leave. So we have a form where we make, when they apply to us for leave, we make them specify on a form if they want to, well, we make them use their sick time if they're out for their own serious health condition. So that's a given. Do they want to use any vacation time? Do they want to use, you know, PL comp time? They have to submit that to us at the time they apply for FMLA, and then we make them stick to that. If they want to make a change, they can make a prospective change, but not a retroactive change. And so it just is a really helpful way of being able to, um, set it in advance, we don't let employees just call up and say, oh, I want to use vacation day today, because it's just really hard to manage. So that's something you can do. If you're looking for forms, simple, like as a sample, you can go to ct.gov and type in um, FMLA HR1. That's our form for FMLA requests in the state. And you'll see what we ask for. Um, other than that, if you don't want to be that formal, I, I really encourage you to have that conversation with the employee and say, hey, I'm filling out this form because you're getting CTPL benefits. Are you planning on using any accruals? Um, the employee is supposed to tell us if anything changes. And so, you know, they need to plan. Like, we, we expect them to plan ahead. So that's kind of how we deal with it. I just want to make a programming note. It says on your materials that we're going to stop this at 11, but we're actually going until 11.15. Okay, so if um, more questions, does any, okay, Tony, I have one run over here. down there. <laughs> Hi, um, you stated that the employer would be notified once an employee has been approved for the leave and how much they're getting. We have approved for the benefits. You right. guys approve leave, we approve benefits. Uh, okay. Yes, so we have never received anything. We, ha we have to hound our employees to send us statements of what they were paid so that we could be the secondary because we we meet up to a hundred percent so is there something we're missing to not get those so i can tell you that in the beginning of january we had a, a glitch and we thought the employer notifications were going out and for a few weeks they weren't but those should have all been caught up so if you're still not getting anything um one we can talk after and i'll look you up and see what's going on. But two, I'm wondering if your employment verification forms are giving somebody else's name. Like, I don't know who's completing your employment verification forms, but we send that notice to whoever the contact person is on that EVF. And so um, if, if the supervisor's filling out the form, they're getting a notice and they may not be telling you. But if that's, because you're shaking your head. So we'll, we'll talk after and I can, I can look you up. I have another question over here. How long does an employee need to be living in Connecticut in order to be eligible for Connecticut paid leave? I'm so glad you asked that question. They don't have to live in Connecticut. They have to work in Connecticut. So they have to be working for a covered employer in Connecticut. So they could live anywhere. Um, there's no specific like, explicit statement in the statute that says you have to work for X amount of weeks or months. However, big however, 
in order to determine eligibility, you have to have earned the 2325 in the highest earning quarter of the first four of the five most recently completed quarters. So if you just started working in Connecticut in January because you moved or you weren't working before, you will have no income in the first four of the five most recently completed quarters. We can't look at, we can't consider income outside of covered employers. Um, a highly paid individual who got 2325 in two weeks could be eligible sort of one quarter plus two weeks. A lower paid individual may have to work longer. Okay. The only exception to the residency is for sole props and self-employed individuals. They do have to reside in Connecticut. Um, and then their eligibility is based on their self-employment earnings as reported to the federal government. They have to have 2325 in the highest earning quarter of the first four of the five most recently completed quarters and living in Connecticut and enrolled with us. But they're the only ones who have to reside here. Okay, I've got a question down here. Hi. Uh, separate from the posters and the taxes being withheld, what's the employer's obligation to let the employee know this benefit? I, I sat down with an employee who's going out on leave, gave him short-term disability, gave him FMLA paperwork, gave him the website for CT um, paid family leave. I'm not sure he got in touch. So if our short-term disability is secondary, do I need to pursue contacting him to see if he's even reached out? So statutorily, the only other obligation would be to complete the employment verification form. What I've seen in practice is that the short-term disability providers are not at all shy about saying, hey, you need to apply first. So they probably have already had that communication. Of course, if you just are working to help your employee and provide good relationships and all of that, you can be like, hey, just remember, you really need to get the claim in to CT paid leave that's different than the short-term disability, um, you want to get that in. But it, it's not the statute. Mm -hmm. So the, the table here has a question. So you stated earlier that people outside the state, regardless of where they live, they could have Connecticut paid FMLA. So if you have remote workers who aren't contributing into the fund, why are they eligible for this? Or if I'm then misunderstanding something. They have to be working in Connecticut. So you could... So what I said is you can yeah. live anywhere as long as you're working in Connecticut. We know, with the whole remote workforce right. now, That's the right. issue is um, where are you reported as working? If the employer reports you for purposes of um, unemployment insurance, for example, as working in Connecticut, then you're working in Connecticut because we use DOL data. Um, if you're not subject to unemployment, so um, Jean, your folks, <laughs> They, you know, may not be subject to unemployment. We have a, we use the same UI standard. There's a four-point test. It's, it's a FAQ on our website if you're interested about kind of locus of control and management to determine are you working in Connecticut or not. But for most of us, we're subject to unemployment responsibilities, obligations. If they pay UI into Connecticut, they're considered to be working in Connecticut. We have another question over here. Yep. Um, so if the employee also has AFLAC as their own personal short-term disability insurance. How is that? They have to file two claims. They There's do, but do you know if that's primary or secondary? Um, I don't. I mean, because AFLAC has a whole, like we, we, we're very careful and we make them be very careful about keeping all of those very, very separate. So like we don't get involved with their, that business and okay. their folks are not allowed to communicate across, across the wall. But um, I can tell you in general, because I've talked to a lot of brokers <laughs> over the past two years, they're like, yeah, we're secondary. Like almost all of them want to be secondary. And frankly, if I, ha if I were an employer who had group coverage, I would be talking to them about reducing the premiums because we just saved them a whole lot of money. So they should be reducing those premiums for you. I've got they're gonna be mad at me now, but sorry. <laughs> got a question over here, Erin, to your right. There you go. Hi, um, is the state of Connecticut supplying employees that are getting paid um, like an earnings statement at the end of the year or should the employer be um, recording that as a third party sick pay? That is a great question. So we provide the employees with an explanation of benefits at the time that the benefit payments are made and we will be providing a 1099 at the end of the year. 
it's not wages, right? Like this doesn't, there's no employer contribution. This is entirely employee funded. It's not a wage. So it's really um, not, like we don't give W-2s. But, I'm, but I will say the statute says that the employee can request of us that we take deductions. And if they want that, they have to give us a W-4. We tell them, just fill out the employee section of the W-4. Don't give that to your employer. We have to use the W-4 because that's the form, but it's not your employer. Like, so if your employee comes to you and says, hey, fill out this W-4 for a pay leave, say, no, I don't need to because <laughs> it's not from you. It's, it's, we'll be filling out that other side of the W-4 if they want deductions. Erin, we have a question over here. Sure. Good morning. Hi. I have an employee um, that is looking at intermittent leave. Um, how do you know if he reports he was out, how do you know from us that he was actually out? So that's a great question. We really struggled with how much to, um, and what proof to get with that, because frankly, we didn't want to add additional burden to employers to have sort of that, have you have to tell us every week. So the obligation is that the employee has to report to us that they're out, when they're out within two days. Um, we reserve the right to kind of do a deep dive and we might reach out on sort of an audit basis to contact employers just to validate that what they're reporting to us is consistent, but we're not doing that on a regular basis. We just do that on occasion. I also, the regular FMLA I've offered him um, and he's refusing, I'm not sure if it's because he, I, I think part of it is he's hiding his con medical condition but I've offered it and I've offered it. Should I document that I offered it and have him sign that he's declining to get it? So I'm so glad you raised that question. Um, I'm gonna, since the DOL folks aren't, you know, Heidi and Jen and Erica aren't here, so I'll answer for them. It's <laughs> FMLA, but there's very good law that says it's the employer's right and responsibility to designate leave as FMLA if you, the employer, know that the employee is eligible and the reason for leave qualifies. So if he's declining and coming to work, then I would just be like, hey, we offered it to you and you said no. But if he's not showing up for work, document, you should be putting him on FMLA and saying we're counting these absences as FMLA related. It protects you, it protects him. Because the, the DOL, the federal DOL has said employees cannot waive their right to FMLA. So a piece of paper saying, oh yes, I declined it, won't provide you protection okay. if he turns around and sues you later. But what if he doesn't give me any medical certification to put in his FMLA? So if you have no um, medical documentation and you don't have it from any other source, like an ADA or a worker's comp, then you document all of that and you treat those absences like any other unexcused absence. So if you have an, a policy that says five unexcused absences and you, you know, get a demerit or whatever, you can do that. Um, and, and sometimes that prompts people to provide that med cert. <laughs> so, but you really want to make sure that, as you were indicating, you document all of it, you put it in writing to him. But if you know that it's a serious health condition and you have um, any sort of documentation to substantiate it, go ahead and, and determine like, so what we have a lot of times is employees who say, oh, I want, I want to take unpaid leave as an accommodation, but don't call it FMLA. And it's like, no, <laughs> we're calling this FMLA. We're tracking down your time. Like, thank you so much for the med cert, and now it's FMLA. Like, that is your, again, employer's right and responsibility. I've got one uh, way on your left, Erin. There you are. Uh, so we have a, uh, I had a current situation where an employee has filed for a paid FL, FMLA, um, and the individual wanted to use vacation just because our policy said the individual would use PTO, um, but we understand that in here that you have to allow the employee to take two, keep two weeks. Is it okay to have them sign off that they would like to have more than two weeks? Because we're still allowing them, but if they would like to continue to take more vacation to get their full rate, uh, is that something that would be allowed? Yeah, so again, like this is really a DOL question 
Um, but the statute has said that the employee must be, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but it's essentially, it's, the employee must be permitted to retain two weeks. But if the employee is like, no, I'd, I'd just rather get my full time and not worry about it, um, there's nothing in the statute that prohibits the employee from making that choice. And as a lawyer, I like documenting things, so getting that documented so that they don't come back and get mad at you later is a good idea. All right, I think we are out of time. Those were all wonderful questions. I think that was really helpful. Aaron, thank you so much.